Welcome back, guys. I'm super excited about this interview. Uh, I actually discovered this author through a mutual friend. We've had her on before, Yolanda Olson, and she could not speak more highly of this particular author, and she absolutely loves her books. So I knew I had to get her on. We're talking USA bestseller, Wall Street Journal bestseller, and I'm a little bit interested by the genre. We've got suspense, psychological thriller. These are not genres I would usually read. But yet I'm intrigued. We have the one and only Clarissa Ann Lynch. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm really good. I want to know, I've never been in Indiana. What is it like? Because you live in Nobs, uh, is it Floyd Nobs or Nobs Floyd? Floyd's Nobs. Mm-hmm. Floyd's Nobs. What is it like living there? Um. Well, I think most of the time when people think of Indiana, they think of northern parts of Indiana, like Indianapolis. And I live in at the southernmost tip of Indiana, right on the border between Indiana and Kentucky, which kind of explains my southern accent that I have. And um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. It's sort of like a farming slash bedroom community. We have a low population. Um, It's very quiet here, uh, which is nice when you're an isolated, seclusive writer, right? (laughs) But um, the one nice thing is that because we're so close to Kentucky, uh, you know, I can get in my car and drive 20 miles and I'm I'm near the city of Louisville, Kentucky. So it's sort of out in the middle of nowhere, but it's not too far from everything else. Yeah, what is it? So I've never been to Kentucky either. What is what is Kentucky like? What is it known for? Uh, well, as far as Kentucky is really sort of known for the Kentucky Derby. And it's sort of a mix because Louisville is sort of this um, sort of big and happening city. But then you have other parts of Indiana and along Kentucky um, that are lots of hills, lots of rural areas as well. So where I'm at, it's a uh, very low population and s- sort of a uh, high, um, high elevation. I, there are a lot of hills where I live, so it's not fun to drive in snow. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful area, but you get a mix of a lot of rural and then also large cities as well. But I would say um, Kentucky is mainly known for the Kentucky Derby, the horse races. That's usually what people think of when when we mention Kentucky. That's so much fun. I'll have to come check it out. And it sounds absolutely beautiful with all the, the mountains and the hills. I want to start talking about your books. Where did your journey start? What made you decide, I want to write a book? And how did you find the publishing process? Um, well, I started writing, I guess it was in about 2012, And I've always been obsessed with reading, obviously, you know, I'm sure a lot of writers are. I I didn't really write very much besides like journaling. Uh, When I was in college, my major was psychology, but for a while I toyed with the idea of maybe doing switching to library sciences or being a librarian. So my goal was always like to some sort of find some sort of way to take my hobby and translate that into a job. But it never really occurred to me to actually try writing the books myself uh, myself, um, until uh, I was home with my son and I couldn't find a book to read. I was on a budget at the time and I had this little bookshelf and I had read every single book on my shelf, some of them more than once. And so... I, and this was in 2012, I don't know if the Kindle wasn't out yet, but it was before I had a Kindle or an iPhone or anything like that. And it was late at night. So the library was closed and I just got this wild idea. Maybe I'll just write my, write a story myself tonight to sort of put me to sleep because I like to read before bed. So, um, I was standing in the kitchen at the stovetop cooking something and I just started writing on a napkin And then I went and grabbed another napkin. And then I was like, okay, I think maybe I should grab a notebook. And so then it sort of steamrolled into this project that I worked on off and on for a year. And I, when I finished the book, it was, I felt a great sense of relief and accomplishment, but I never had any plans whatsoever to try and get the book published. Never even crossed my mind. It was really just like a stress reliever, something for fun. 
So I put the book up, uh, I printed it out, I put it aside. And then it wasn't until about two years later, we were moving to another house and I found it. And I was like, oh my, this is going to be fun. Like, I'm going to read this book that I wrote and see how bad it is, you know. So I sat down to read it and I thought, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I was like, this isn't so bad. You know, that this is kind of good. I was kind of impressed. You know, when you're away from a project for a while, you can kind of see it with fresh eyes. So I was like, okay, this is, this is pretty good. But still, I didn't think about getting it published. Um, I, I sent it over to my sister to have her read it. And it was my sister who really pressured me uh, to try and get it published. So I had no clue anything about publishing, but she sort of helped me find some indie publishers that I could submit to without an agent. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to send it off, you know? So I sent it out to about a dozen uh, small indie publishers. And I think I'd forgot about it. And about a month and a half later, I received an email and a contract offer. And I thought it was a joke to be honest with you. At the time I was like, someone was playing a prank. Um, so it, it really was unexpected how it all sort of happened. But I mean, I quickly fell in love with writing. And once I held that first book in my hand, I was like, okay, I'm hooked. I'm in for the long haul now. How did you find the publishing process? Because if you weren't anticipating any of that at all with very little knowledge, it would have been very overwhelming, I imagine. It was. Um, but it was also really exciting. Like, it just, it's like, I can't believe that I've taken, here's this idea that was in my head and then on a piece of paper and someone's gonna fix it up and, and help make it better. And they're gonna turn it into a book. It was just like so surreal to me. So the whole um, experience of getting the first book published was just like, it was mind blowing. It was just so exciting really at every stage. So it was overwhelming, but in a good way. Um, so as time has gone on and now I've signed with an agent and the process is even more um, complex now that I'm with a larger publisher. But I, I mean, I'll never forget that first year, you know, of the book coming out. It was just, you know, it was so exciting. Did you do anything for the launch day? Like, did you do um, any, I don't know, like signing books at a local library or celebrate for yourself? I did. Um, and me and my sister, we had like a little get together at a local pub and um, people from around town came and I signed copies. And it was just so cool, you know, uh, people I hadn't seen since high school. So I really didn't have any like online connections then. So I was just sort of coming on to the Facebook author scene and all that. So really, my only thoughts were, OK, I just got to tell everyone I know, like locally. So that was sort of where I started was just trying to find one reader at a time. <laughs> it's so funny because my launch day was exactly like that. I was in a country town and we were at a pub and it, I love small town communities. That's why I love them. I want to discuss one of the books that grabbed my attention uh, was Without a Trace. So mm -hmm. I would like you to t tell me a little bit about, because this is not a genre I would usually read it kind of, it scares me a little bit just because I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Um, so can you, can you tell me about that book? Uh, yeah. Uh, Without a Trace, actually, uh, it, the idea for it was really sort of bizarre because uh, my daughter played this really clever prank on me where she uh, was hollering for me to come back to her room, you know, mommy, mommy, come here. I'm in, I'm in bed. I'm under the covers. And I came into her room and there's this little lump under the bed and I pulled the covers back and she had this doll in her bed. And it was this porcelain doll that we picked up at a flea market. And I, I mean, it was a pretty doll, but I thought it was a little creepy and it was made of glass and she had a little cracked cheek. And my daughter was like, it's me. I'm the doll. I turned into the doll. And of course she's hiding right there in the closet, her little face. I can see her. And I, I, we were just laughing so hard. It was so cute. So later that same night I was sitting down and I needed to start on a new book and I was kind of struggling to come up with a new idea and I thought you know as a mother this idea of uh, you know coming into your child's room pulling back the covers and there being a toy or a doll or stuffed animal there but your child is not um, so that was sort of how that book began because the very first chapter of Without a Trace 
it's a mother and she's sort of coming out of a domestic violence situation and she goes in to check on her daughter and she sees this form underneath the blankets and pulls it down and there's this creepy stuffed rabbit and her daughter's missing. Um, so my, my daughter helped me come up sort of initially with that idea, but without a trace, it's, it's this told from three different points of view. It's, uh, the mother whose, whose child is missing. And then the female cop who is trying to, trying to track down the little girl. And then also the neighbor who lives next door, who thinks that she may or may not have seen something that night. She might've seen someone carrying the girl out. Uh, so the story really, um, delves into a lot of issues that I've wanted to touch on for a long time, domestic violence, um, motherhood, and sort of how the stigma of, of being in a, a domestic violence situation that sometimes you're not taking seriously or that you're sort of viewed as weak. So without a trace, it, you know, it's got a, a sort of creepy storyline, but it also has a lot of sort of uh, women's issues that I was able to address in that book. So that book is near and dear to my heart. I want to talk a little bit about the genres. As I said, these genres are very foreign to me um, as a reader. So I'm always intrigued what differentiates between like suspense or mystery or psychological thriller. Um, and what advice would you have for authors who are writing this genre? Are there certain key elements they need for this particular genre? Well, um, I would say a lot of the confusion, I mean, it is confusing the different genres. I mean, it can be even confusing for me because a lot of times, you know, the lines are blurred between the different genres. Um, but one main thing that I always keep in mind is like with horror, for example, the idea is to horrify the reader or to terrify them or to scare the reader but with a thriller while you might still have some of those thrills and chills and kind of high stakes that you would have with the horror genre a thriller is more there's more of a journey um and it's less about scaring the reader and more about letting the reader sort of unravel the situation mm -hmm. while there's also different scares along the way uh mystery is less there's less risk to the protagonist in the story, but uh, you know, it's similar to thriller in that there's usually something very specific that you need to unravel or uncover in the end. So if you're, if you're a little uh, squeamish, I would say um, reading thriller or mystery might be better than reading horror because horror tends to have more of that shock and gore factor than some of the other genres, but they blur lines. I mean, you know, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what category your book fits into. I think perhaps that is why I had a misconception about, uh, you know, the numerous genres there because I was always like, oh, I feel like I would be unsettled or I would be scared by that, but I am a scaredy cat. Um, but I think I automatically assume there's going to be horror or there's going to be something jumping out. Like as soon as you started saying porcelain doll, I was like, uh -uh, I'm out. <laughs> so, so I'm very um, sensitive when it comes to that <laughs> stuff. But I do like the way that you've explained it, that it's more so the unraveling of what's happening. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll give it a go. Maybe you've convinced me. I like though the themes that you're also threading through. So do you have to do a lot of research on these? As you said, you were talking about domestic violence. Did you have to do a lot of research to know realistically how your characters, like what their patterns are, what their triggers are, et cetera? Well, in general, when I'm writing, I tend to pick subjects that I already know some about and that I have, you know, that I'm passionate about, but I, there's always some amount of research that needs to be done. And specifically with that book in domestic violence is I had to look into the different laws between states, like with restraining orders, um, what those laws were, what custody issues might be involved uh, when there's a child involved in a domestic violence situation. So there are always, elements with every book that I write that that need to be researched somewhat but I'm not a huge research person and that I tend to try to kind of go into it with things that I've previously read about or, or have taken it in because I think it sort of helps um, to sort of have that you know in advance and that I'm really into the subject whatever it is but there's always some that has to be done what is it like 
to be traditionally published because you are published through HarperCollins, I believe. How is that, how was that process for you starting off with an indie publisher and then escalating into a larger field, so to speak, to then get the agent? How, how did you acquire your agent or did they approach you? And then how was the feeling of that success of getting HarperCollins, which is one of the top five? That's an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Um, it's been, you know, it's been a ride, really, because I feel like, you know, sometimes all we see is the good stuff. You know, you see when someone posts, I, I have an agent, I've signed with this agent, and, you know, these big announcements are, I've signed with Harper Collins. Uh, but usually, you know, as a writer, you know, behind the scenes, there's so much going on and so much work. So, I published, I believe, about nine or 10 indie, I had nine or 10 indie published books before, and before I went traditional. And to be honest with you, the process as far as, you know, the, the publishing process itself is similar other than when with a larger publisher, there's a lot more marketing involved. Uh, I have one, more than one editor most of the time. So there's a lot more there's some extra steps uh, in the publishing process and they do sort of step in and help a little bit more. So in the marketing department, but really I feel like I, all those years of indie publishing, um, they made me who I was as a writer. So I don't see that I would have, I don't understand sometimes when I see people who jump right into traditional, I'm like, there's no way I could have done that because it took me a long time to sort of build my craft. As far as getting an agent, um, I, I sent out queries to agents for years before I signed with an agent. So it wasn't an overnight thing. I wrote multiple books, um, trying to get signed with an agent. So it was really exciting when, when that happened, because, you know, agents can help sort of open the door up. Um, but as far as, you know, I'm concerned, it, it's all the different types of publishing I've indie published and self-published. I've done them all. And, um, I'm glad that I have because, you know, there are so many things that you can't in the indie publishing arena where you learn a lot about marketing. You make a lot of connections more so than you do in the traditional side. And I'm just so thankful for those. I don't think I would have been able to do it without the indie community. I love that. And I also, this is a familiar story uh, in the sense that I like to point it out here is that it wasn't an overnight success where you had that traditional publisher that you had a backlist you had eight or nine books and as you said you were querying and if that didn't go through with that agent you didn't find your right agent at that time then you would publish that book and you kept doing that process so I love this because it's just example not to be disheartened if you can't find an agent now that's perfectly okay you haven't found your right agent and I can't stress that enough is that a lot of people I feel like will jump out and grab the first agent that they can and just remember that you can say no, you should say no if it's not a good fit. So I absolutely love that divine timing and how it's worked for you and the large journey that you've gone on and you're really successful because of it. So congratulations. It's amazing to see your hard work pay off. Thank you. What, um, do you do a lot of like, obviously not now, but a lot of conventions and, and signings? Uh, I would say compared to a lot of other authors in the, in like the indie community, I don't. Um, however, I think I've been to six or seven signings over the past several years. Now, obviously with COVID, it was really, you know, difficult and most of the signings got canceled, but I do love to do them. I just love to sort of get out and meet readers and talk with other authors. They're so much fun. You know, it can be a big expense, especially when you're when you have to travel somewhere. So, you know, I always try to take into consideration, you know, the costs and with COVID, it was difficult. But the last one that I went to was I went to the Stanley Hotel in Colorado, you know, where they, um, Stephen King got the inspiration for The Shining. And that was a really neat signing because the hotel was just so cool and it was packed with readers. It was really great. That's really cool. What would you say then your most memorable reader moment has been? I, you know, I, I can think of so many because my readers are just amazing and generous. But for me, I think it was um, 
probably when I received a message on Facebook from a reader who was really going through a hard time and struggling with a lot of mental health issues. And it wasn't necessarily that she was saying, you know, your book saved me or your book, you know, did this, but she was just saying, you know, your book really, it it helped keep me entertained and helped keep my thoughts off things while I was going through something. And I can remember thinking, you know, that is the best case scenario for me because, you know, I don't necessarily write to prove any sort of point to anyone. I just want to keep people entertained. You know, it's a great way to escape. So it really meant a lot to me that, that my books, you know, sort of helped get her mind off all the things that were going on in her life. So that meant a lot. Any sort of message or feedback from readers is always great to hear. I don't think they realize sometimes how much it means to us, but it really does. You are a USA bestseller and a Wall Street Journal bestseller as well. What was the moment like for you? And most importantly, how did you celebrate it? Um, well, to be honest, I, I was completely surprised. My first solo title that hit was um, for a book called My Sister is Missing. And I had no idea that it had hit um, a friend of mine who got the sort of PDF list the night before contacted me and was like, your book is on this list. And I was just stunned. Um, So that time it was so exciting. And then not too long after that is when Without a Trace hit USA Today and hit the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Both times I found out like on a weekday night when I had the kids and there were things going on. So I celebrated, you know, with a glass of wine and, you know, not too much. But and then my husband and I went out and sort of celebrated and had dinner later that week. But both nights, both times it happened, it was like a school night and I was busy and it was just like hard to sort of process, but it was so exciting. Amazing. What has been your favorite book to write and why? Uh, That's a really hard question because (laughs) I feel like of all this, I've written a lot of stories and at some point they've all been my favorite. You know, I think, and probably other writers are like that too. When I'm writing a book, I'm like, okay, this one's my favorite. This one is, you know, this one's the best one. Um, But I guess uh, probably either the book that I just finished that's not out yet that I'm recently working on, or another one that comes to mind is Like Follow Kill because it it was one of the only books in which I wrote the ending before I started the beginning, which was strange, but I knew exactly how I wanted it to end uh, scene by scene. So it was kind of cool that I wrote the ending and that I could sort of, I always had an end goal the whole way, like I was working toward it. And the main character in Like Follow Kill, her name is Camilla. And I think she's the most unlikable female character that I've ever written. And I don't know why, but I just... Uh, she was really fun to write <laughs> but that's a hard question <laughs> there's so it's like many asking, it's why I love asking it's like asking what's your favorite child because everyone's so begrudging when I ask that question but it's interesting too because a, a lot of authors answer the same they're like I've loved each and every one for like you know whatever's the most recent is usually the one that they're really heartfelt on at the time what would be your three top marketing tips for fellow authors? Hmm. Um, I would say, and I don't know that these are really that good, but I think one is connecting with other authors is really important, not just because it helps to have that support and community, but also, you know, other authors will help connect you to their readers. And for me with, when I got started in the indie community, I had no readers. I didn't know any other authors. And I just was lucky that I met up with a couple authors online and they sort of hooked me up with a Facebook event or different things that were going on. And slowly, you know, I started to build a readership, but I can't tell you how many times I relied on another author for advice or, Hey, I'm going to go check out and see what are they doing? That's marketing. That's working. That's working for them. Um, So I definitely think making genuine connections with other authors is, is a really good thing to do. Um, and I also think making genuine connections with your readers, there's so much pressure nowadays with all the social media platforms, like to be everywhere as an author, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, 
um, Instagram. But I think, you know, instead of sometimes we focus on trying to be everywhere all at once. And I think sometimes we need to just kind of hone in on, okay, which, which platforms are you most comfortable with? And, you know, really work on building your readership there, whether it's Facebook and Twitter or three or four. So for me, I spent a lot of time on Facebook and Twitter and I, I do have an Instagram account now and recently set up a TikTok. But I think, you know, sort of learning to pace yourself and really make real connections with readers because, you know, they can they can find your book on Amazon. They don't always need the links, but they if they come to your page, they probably want to know more about you, more about your book. So I think making those connections and being genuine um, with your readers is important. And I think uh, also sometimes, uh, you know, we get so caught up in marketing and I really feel like it's okay to pull back sometimes from social media, spend some time, spend more time reading and working on your craft, write the best possible book because, you know, nothing sells, sells a book better than if it's good. So sometimes I think, you know, if, if the marketing isn't going well and, you know, you're not pull back, start working on your next work, work on trying to, um, you know, build some of those skills and, uh, and come back with a new project. So, so I guess that would be my marketing. (laughs) I don't know how good it was, but those are are great tips. And I think it is important to to stress on, especially the one you were uh, mentioning in social media, because it is so easy to get bogged down with social media, especially as you were saying, trying to cover all platforms Um, But also, it's not about I need to post every day, I need to get something out, I need to, you know, hit the algorithm of Instagram or, you know, TikTok, whatever it may be. It's about actually providing your readers, as you were saying, providing your readers with content with who you are. And if you're not genuinely doing that, then you're not really going to get the outcome that you're hoping for. So just remember, the point of that is for connection. It's not about hitting all of those likes and, you know, that sense of I got 100 likes today. You really want to connect with your readers. So I think that's a really invaluable point to make as well. What would you say your greatest accomplishment and your greatest challenge has been in your career so far? Um, I would say as far as accomplishment, I think when I signed with my agent, it felt like a big accomplishment because I had written so many books and sort of worked towards that goal. Uh, But I think really the big challenge along the way is, well, everything is so challenging in publishing, like from writing the book itself is hard enough. And then you get this book finished and then you have to begin, okay, is, is, am I going to be able to sell the book to a publisher? Um, or if you're self-publishing or doing indie publishing, you know, what sort of cover am I going to pick? Who am I going to hire as an editor? And then, you know, so that process, trying to get it sold and then um, trying to market it to the right readers. I feel like every step of publishing is challenging. I mean, I really do. But I think the biggest challenge for me is just has been not giving up because there's been so many, you know, you see all the good stuff, but you don't see all the disappointments and all the struggles and stuff behind the scenes, all the books I've had to shelf, you know, along the way. And I think not giving up is in a way my greatest accomplishment and challenge really, because I think that there were so many steps along the way when I could have given up and I just kept pushing on and and it's, it's gotten better, but you know, even now it's, it's a challenge. Publishing is hard work. One of my um, favorite, I don't know if it's so much a quote, but a, a meme or whatever it might be, but it shows, you know, the tip of the iceberg um, above the surface, which is a success, but then you don't obviously see the layers underneath of all the hard work and effort and the disappointment and the obstacles and the rejection and everything else that bundles into it you never really see that. So it can really feel like sometimes you're slugging through mud and you think, what way do I go? Why am I doing this? And it's important to sit back and remind yourself why you're doing this. And that's also when you do have your support network, your author friends who understand the process. So when you're having one of those days, you can lean on them because they know what it's like. This is one of my favourite questions to ask. What is your goal that you're chasing what is the dream that you're after for your career you know 
as a writer, I feel like, of course, I, I have a big imagination and like, like other authors, I have, you know, I have ridiculous dreams. Like a, I want, I would love to see my book as a movie or I would love to see my book in a book club. But I think over the years, I just always try to remind myself that the number one goal for me at every stage is just to gain more readers with each book, bring in more readers each time and, and other things will come along the way. So I know that's sort of, I don't, that's not really an answer, but for me, I always try to remind myself of that. It's not about hitting the list. It's not about all these other things. Just focus on trying to pull in more readers and those other things will come because you can't, oh, you can't control everything, you know, and we would love to be able to turn our book into a movie or do all these things. But a lot of times, you know, it's some of that's out of our hands. So, but trying to pull in the readers that's in our hands. So that's one goal I try to stay focused on. I think too, one of the exciting things about being on this particular path is you never know what door could open. You never know what way it could go. You might get Netflix, you might get, you know, international translation, right? You just, you never know. And so that's what also makes it exciting. As long as you have your base and your foundation of, you know, that constant income and feeling gratitude and success, all the other bits and pieces are absolutely perks. And I think you're right when you say, we need to remember we're not in control of the situation. We can't predict what is going to happen. We can have good intention of what we want, but that's what makes it so exciting. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, I do have a new segment. It's called Speed Dating with an Author. So you and I are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I'm a sweetheart. Uh, and my first question is, what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Um, well, I'm pretty clumsy, so that's hard. I think I've broken my uh, pinky toe on my right foot four or five times, but I guess my most clumsiest moment, I don't know if this would count that comes to mind is, uh, when I started at college, I, I'm a planner, so I like to plan everything ahead, but what I didn't plan for was how packed the parking situation was going to be. And so one thing about me is I am I am not a very good driver and I really hate parking. So I was struggling to parallel park and I think I did it, tried it like 60 times. I don't even know. And people were just watching me and it was like the most mortifying thing ever. And so, you know, if this was a book, the good ending would be that I finally got it right. But actually I drove off because finally I was like, I can't take this anymore. So I drove off and I drove like two blocks away and I parked in a McDonald's and I thought, you know, I think my car will be okay here. I'll just park here and walk. Um, and not being used to being in the city after I got out of class, I got there just as my car was being towed. And so it was like, oh my gosh, it was the most mortifying day ever. <laughs> so that's not really clumsy, but you know, mortifying, I guess. Oh my goodness. Question about the toe being broken about four times. Is that from kicking it and stubbing it on things? Yes. And once I... <laughs> Once I broke it once, it seemed like, I don't know if it's just that the toe wasn't right, because it seems like I was a lot more clumsy after that. So it was like more likely to happen again. It would just like, I'd be walking and it would get caught on something. It's like, oh my gosh, it, there it goes. It's broken again. <laughs> well, um, don't be too mortified about the car getting towed. I have had this experience in the city also and I was with my sister and this was like two days before I was going over to the States. So I just exchanged all my money into uh, American money and we came back and I was like, dude, where's my car? And it was literally that moment. And I was walking through where we realized I'd accidentally parked in front of the council. And Jess is like, how did you not? That's my sister. She's like, how did you not know you parked in front of the council? I was like, I don't know. It was an available spot in the city. I was like, yeah, you do. So, and then and made it, I had to pay double to get my car because it was on a Sunday as well because they're not standardly open that day. I was like, but you could tow my car away. So obviously you are. It was just crazy. So I was walking through the city with my my glasses on just crying the whole time so were you able to chase him down at least or did you have to meet him at the pickup I actually I chased him down and I just begged the guy I was like listen this has been the worst day ever it's my first day of college I had to walk all the way here and he he was actually really nice and he unhooked it and he let me have it so I got I got really lucky in that sense so it could have been worse 
What are the three words that would best describe you? I would say uh, loyal. Uh, I'm fiercely loyal and uh, obsessive about things that I care about and introverted. Okay, really? Yes, I'm very introverted. <laughs> okay. Amazing. I wouldn't have expected that. Okay, awesome. Well, that's good. <laughs> You've been fooling me this whole time. No, I'm kidding. What uh, is the song that best describes you? Um, I would say Doll Parts by Courtney Love. It's my favorite song to listen to. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's it's my song. It's been my one of my alarm song for like years now on my phone. Interesting. Yeah. What would you say your life motto is? Uh, probably pretty, uh, not a really pretty motto, but just to work hard and be kind. I always tell my kids, you know, if you can choose to do anything at all today, just please be kind because you never know what others are going through. So I would say that's probably it. What is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not many people know of? Uh, <laughs> I guess I would say, well, if, for a while in my 20s, I uh, had this wild dream of being a professional poker player. And I uh, really love to play cards. I know a lot about like statistics with cards and I can shuffle cards and poker chips like nobody's business. So most people probably don't know that. <laughs> That's really cool. We need to have a game of poker sometime. Uh huh. That would be fun. So what is coming out for you this year? What should we be on the lookout for? And where do we find you? Well, I don't have a date next, set yet for my next book, but I just turned it in. So it's in my editor's hands and it doesn't even have a title yet, even though it's done. And when I say done, you know, I mean, done as in I finished the first round of it because it's going to go through editing and all that. But it's about a woman who is going through recovery and she recently lost custody of her young daughter and her sort of eccentric aunt and uncle have taken over custody and she ha is forced to move to their sort of creepy stone gargoyle covered house out in the middle of nowhere to grovel for her custody rights back and it's a really um sort of atmospheric story it was kind of creepy to write but also it sort of delves into mental health and the stigma and how you know it's so hard to overcome as a mother if you make mistakes um that people are very unforgiving. So I'm really, really excited and I'm hoping I'll have a date for that soon and a title, but I'm sort of waiting for all the official details on that. Um, and you can find me on most places online, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram are the main three places. And I love to chat with readers. So, you know, if feel free, feel free to message me, you know, leave me a comment, uh, shoot me an email. I love all that. So Amazing. any way they can, yeah, I, I want to talk to them. <laughs> Amazing. I do. I have a question of that actually too. One, is it a common practice to hand in your first draft without a title? Um, well, usually I don't, but what I have found over this will be my seventh book that I've turned into Harper Collins. And what I've found is that usually my editor has better ideas on titles than I do. So this time I have a few ideas in my mind of, of what I would maybe call it, but I wanted to sort of wait and um, collaborate with her. So I don't know that it's common, but for me, I was like, you know, it's probably going to get changed anyway. So let's hold off and, and where we can sort of sit down and, and talk it through. Yeah. My second question from that as well, is, sorry, I'm bombarding you with last minute questions, um, is your, your themes for your books obviously have a very psychological base to them. So I wonder if a lot of that does come from you studying psychology. Do you think that's where the interest sort of came from? Obviously you had that particular like that's what you were interested to start off with how people work why they work in certain situations so do you think that's why you have more of an in-depth understanding 
when you're writing your books? Uh, possibly. I feel like even before I went to school for psychology, it's just this sort of um, deep desire to know more about people and their stories. Like that was my favorite part of psychology was, you know, learning the background information and learning info about people's lives and why they were the way that they were and what makes them tick. So I've always sort of had this deep interest in trying to understand people because I feel like everyone has a story. Um, you know, even villains, everybody has a story of why they are the way that they are. So I feel like it's something I've always had, but I do think, you know, the psychology training plays a role in that. I'm sure it, it's helped with some of that. But it's just this like insatiable interest I have in, in trying to figure people out. Yeah. I love that. That is all my questions today. Thank you so much for coming on. I've had such a good time. Me too. Thank you so much. I was so excited to do that. I was nervous, but I was really excited. And this was really fun. It was. And now you, you might have convinced me slightly to go and give it a go, but I'm sure I'll love it but I am still a little bit tiny bit apprehensive and scared, but I know I'm going to love it. So I'm excited for it. Um, I am going to drop your links below where we can grab your books. And is there any parting message you have for perhaps upcoming writers or your readers? Um, just, I would say thank you so much to my readers. Uh, I couldn't do what I do without them. And some of them have been with me since the very beginning of my career. And um, I just want them to know that I'm so much more grateful than they probably even realize. And for authors, I would just say, don't give up. Don't over-focus on one book. If a book doesn't sell or isn't doing well, just move on to the next one. You just got to keep rolling with the punches at every stage because publishing never, it never gets easy. No matter what stage you're at, it's always tough. Amazing. Well, I'm going to love you and leave you. I hope you have a good day. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.